Hi, everyone. My name is William Zhang, and I'm thrilled to be presenting this research on neural networks for kidney injury decision making. So just a quick thing about myself, I am a Master's of Public Health candidate at the Yale School of Public Health in Chronic Disease Epidemiology. Before this, I worked as an infectious disease epidemiologist at the Public Health Agency of Canada, and this work is part of my work on my thesis with Dr. Francis Wilson at CITRA, or the Clinical and Translational Research Accelerator. After this, I am working in economics, consulting, and litigation support. So now we're going to talk about some kidneys. So the subject of this talk is on acute kidney injury, or AKI, which is the abrupt loss of kidney function. So this is prevalent in the hospital. We see that one out of five inpatients have this, and this leads to a three to 10 uh, fold higher risk of death. And currently we see that there are three major obstacles in AKI care. Firstly, there is a failure of providers to diagnose AKI. As well, we see that AKI is present in many indications, so it's heterog heterogeneous. And lastly, sometimes we don't have specialists and nephrologists to look at AKI. And sometimes when we do have them, we are under underutilizing them. So something that has already been implemented is a kidney action team, or a KAT. So this is comprised of a nephrologist, an advanced practitioner, and a clinical pharmacist who will, in conjunction with electronic health record alerts, be able to provide personalized treatment recommendations for patients. However, we know that KAT implementation works and can provide these recommendations, but staffing these kind of teams can be resource intensive. So despite this, there is no clinical automated decision support system out there for AKI. So with this research, our question is, can we use AI to replace the KAT or to aid the KAT in providing automated and accurate patient-specific recommendations? So looking here at this flowchart, we see at the beginning, if a hospitalized adult acquires an AKI, there is an EHR alert sent to the kidney action team. Then the team will review the chart and create this sort of individualized recommendation. And we are wondering if AI can replace these two steps or aid with these two steps with the major goal of being able to assess whether these recommendations impact outcomes, such as AKI progression, dialysis, and death at 14 days, as you can see here. That is a future goal to evaluate. So just quickly going over the data, we currently have 1,831 adults with AKI across six hospitals at the Yale New Haven Health System. And this is a part of the ongoing Kidney Action Team KTAKI clinical trial, which is wrapping up enrollment of 4,000 patients across both Yale New Haven Health and John Hopkins Health System. So this trial basically trained physicians and pharmacists to make these discrete rec recommendations for AKI workup, treatment, evaluation across a couple of diagnostic and therapeutic domains, which you will see um, at the time of AKI diagnosis. So just going over the sample and who we're looking at, uh, the median age is 73 years, around 50% were women, and around 20% self-identified as Black. And now to go over these recommendation categories. So we found that across six broad recommendation categories and encompassing 21 common specific recommendations out of the possible 46, all of these captured more than 95% of the recommendations made by uh, kidney action teams across 100 recommendations. So these are the ones that we're really going to focus on when we examine the implications of these results. So to go over an example of the breadth of these kind of recommendations, uh, we see that the six broad categories include diagnostic recommendations, such as monitoring urine output, acid-base related recommendations, such as checking a lactate and toxic alcohols in the blood, potassium uh, recommendations, such as rechecking the potassium, um, volume recommendations, such as a chest x-ray, medication recommendations, such as changing the antibiotic, and lastly, renal consultation. So going over how a neural network can aid with how a human team can give these personalized recommendations, with half of the data, we trained a neural network that predicts all 43 possible recommendations. So one highlight of this neural network is that we can use one single network architecture to output all 43 recommendations. So rather than running 43 individual models in parallel, we can have this shared representation, which also increases the statistical power by having more outcomes in this one, um, one representation. So we have a network width of 12 neurons and two fully connected residual layers. And we also controlled for over specification of the data by joint training across recommendations. 
We then batch normalize to standardize without the trainable parameters because we are also using L2 regularization and we use the one six of the validation set as early stopping. I am breezing through these methods because the implication of the results and the clinical application to me is really interesting. So looking at how we're evaluating the concordance or this kind of AI versus humans, um, the primary endpoint is seeing how often and how well these two agree. So we will be looking at concordance and this confusion matrix here kind of illustrates visually what happens when the human teams and the AI are agreeing or not fully agreeing. To put that into numbers, we will be using the final third as a test set and we calculated individual AUCs. So the area under the receiver operating curve will be used as a metric to see whether or not the model is giving a higher score to patients give, getting the recommendation versus patients not getting the recommendation. So we have calculated a median AUC across all 43 recommendations. And also we are taking out a few key, key, uh, key performance indicators as done by global consensus guidelines, which you will see in two slides. So after running all of this through the neural network, we see that for each patient, 43 recommendations were made for a total of 78,733 predictions. And this diagram on the right kind of illustrates how we would have all of these outputs in this output layer. We found that the median AUC across all recommendations was 0.74, and the um, interquartile range was between 0.67 and 0.83. So now I would like to show you the implications of these results uh, with some examples of recommendations. So three things to keep in mind, uh, both for the current results and for future iterations of this work, are firstly that we are assuming that when we make these recommendations, that the kidney action team, the humans, are predicting things correctly and accurately. And we know that clinically that is not always the case. So there is no gold standard metric and that will show in the performance of the AUCs. So looking at the diagnostic recommendations, one second thing to keep an eye out for is that some recommendations are more deterministic and some recommendations are more probabilistic. So deterministic ones are easier for us to have concordance on and probabilistic ones that are more subjective are based on both provider factors and patient level factors. So one example of this would be to check the creatine kinase levels. So this is very provider specific. Some providers will organize this test and some will not order this test. And a third thing to look at is potential collapsibility of some of these recommendations. So for example, the ultrasound and the bladder scan, usually providers will order one or the other, but not both to check for a urinary obstruction. So potentially collapsing variable groups like this may give us better statistical power as well. So now taking a look at the acid-base recommendations. So we see that we have an AUC of 0.9 almost for each and an AUC closer to one is greater. And we see that checking a lactate or giving a bicarbonate are potentially less common and more specific recommendations, but still have a great potential to impact care. So why do we do maybe so well on these or, or what is the clinical value here? So we think that there's good clinical value in having these lesser done recommendations because these are potentially the recommendations that providers may not always think of themselves. So if the AI can help remember things that a provider can't, then we think that that's a good use. So moving on to potassium recommendations, uh, these are almost at one AUC. So why do we do so well on potassium recommendations? And this is again, going back to the idea that some of these recommendations are more deterministic. So there will only be so many reasons why a provider is asking for telemetry, probably because your potassium levels are too high, or if your potassium levels are too low, you may need to replete your, your potassium. So we think that both the AI is getting these right, but also providers are doing a good job at getting this right. So that might explain why we're seeing such high AUCs. So now looking at volume recommendations and medication recommendations, we see slightly lower AUCs. And this may be because these things are just harder to predict in real life. There may be many reasons why a provider may order a chest X-ray. And we see that for medications as well. Lastly here, we see that for renal consult, we have an AUC of 0.8. And we think that this is great because we have a model that can predict who, which patients a nephrologist thinks should see a nephrologist. So if we have a model that tells us maybe that a patient should get care in nephrology or specialized care early on in the care pathway, then this could be useful in order to 
um, have the clinical ap applicability of this kind of system in an EHR or in a renal console on demand. So as this project continues to unfold, there's a few other things that we will be doing. So as I mentioned with the collapsibility, there may be recommendation coarsening for these 43 recommendations. Some of them may be collapsed. As well, there will be external temporal validation once all of the data comes in with data both from John Hopkins Health System as well as choosing a time point and looking at a temporal validation. And the last two ideas are that potentially these could be seen in a trial setting. So firstly, if human kidney action teams will make these recommendations alongside AI recommendations. And lastly, if we were able to randomize just simply to AI recommendations themselves. So with that, I would like to acknowledge this team who has helped me understand both these methods and also take me under their wing. Um, and also a thank you to the Clinical and Translational Research Accelerator and the Yale School of Public Health. Um, I reference this slide and thank you so much. All right. So while we wait for questions, um, it was kind of unclear to me when you're looking at the predictions. So it looks like you're predicting every single possible recommendation out of, I think, over 100 recommendations, even though only 21 were very important. Are you, because I can imagine that when you give a recommendation, you actually may include multiple of those, right? So it's not just, oh, give potassium, they give potassium and like they always say, stop all nephrotoxic yeah. medications, right? So right. how are you handling that? Are you just doing, you know, when you're looking at, especially when you're calculating the accuracy, are you saying that, oh, if they get one of them right or they get all of them right? Like, how are you doing that? Right. So, so far, our study isn't looking at conjoint recommendations. So grouping or coupling of recommendations, that would be an excellent future action. Of the remaining 46 possible recommendations, currently, we are just looking at them at these decisions one by one. So if a kidney action team member has recommended for a chest X-ray or an echocardiogram, uh, we see whether or not and how often that recommendation was also done by the AI. So we're just looking at recommendations one by one so far. Any questions at all? All right, I'll follow a question for input data. So when you, it wasn't clear to me, you said you wanted to look at review chart, individualized recommendation, that seems to be the output. But input, are you inputting the chart information or tabular data or how is that going in before the neural network comes out with the recommendation? Right, so all of this input data is coming from both REDCap and from EPIC. So we have data about patient's age, patient's um, comorbidities, and um, years of experience of the provider, who the provider was. That way we can account for a lot of the variability that you know some of these recommendations are very subjective. So we try to account for the variability by also looking at a lot of provider side factors in addition to kind of these more clinical baseline and input data things from just EHR systems. Right. So with tabular data mostly, but hopefully if you can, you know, access the text in unstructured. Right. Know. From like report forms as well. Yeah, that would be great. 